exponentially got greater the day after I quit drinking and drugging. So I gotta do whatever it takes to make sure I don't go down that path again. And then from 700, we bumped up to like 1.5. And that's when I saw this issue happen. Because in my mind, same thing as you guys, hey, we have a million dollars of revenue that's come in in the first nine months. Like, where's the money? And soon to be a new company coming, coming down the pipe. Really? Yeah. Can you say that on this? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and say it. We'll announce it here. Oh, shit. Cheers, man. Cheers. Welcome. Liquid death. Welcome to your podcast. It's been a, it's a wild time for us the last two months. It has been. I don't know how you've been dealing with it. Um, you were doing like a lot of 16 hour days, right? 16 is a f probably a fair <laughs> number. Um, sometimes 18. Yeah, I don't know how. That's just, I've noticed it without sleep, dude. You can't, you can't operate without sleep. How are you operating? I operate pretty well without sleep. Really? I had years of practice, of, you know, back when I was younger. Partying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for people who are wondering, by the way, this is like the first ever Blake and Blake podcast. Blake and Blake. I've still got another one coming with Blake Day. That's so, right. But uh, so for people who are not familiar with Blake 2, you're, you're Blake 2 technically here. Okay. And uh, tell them what you do and, you know, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> Most importantly... Blake Becker, father, <laughs> husband, and business owner, Becker Home Maintenance, and soon to be a new company coming coming down the pipe. Really? Yeah. Can you say that on this? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and say it. We'll announce it here. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Becker Custom Builders mm. will be coming out um, if all goes well and I pass my last general contract year exam. We'll be um, hopefully operating in 2023. So what's the difference between the custom builders versus home maintenance? Well, maintenance, of course, is maintenance. Uh, we've grown the maintenance division from just handyman to you know, more subcontractor style departments mm -hmm. like flooring, painting, cabinetry, et cetera. Um, you know, but we're going to keep expanding the maintenance side of Becker Home Maintenance while the leads that come in for general contracting, remodeling, or building that have been funneled to our other contractor friends over the past five or six years will now be funneled into Becker Custom Builders where we specialize in uh, remodels, uh, custom builds, you know, just, you know, all depending on what comes in through our lead process. Mm, interesting. So that's why whenever I call you, you're like, hey, I can't talk right now. I'm studying. <laughs> you're studying. I'm studying. So what's that look to do? Like, what what did you have to do to, you're getting your GC, you had to get your GC, I'm guessing. Yes. What does that look like? Well, I mean, it's just really years of experience working for other builders or general contractors and then being able to go through the process of the school and pass the test at the uh, state exam. Okay. All right. That's exciting, dude. It's real exciting. Yeah. Did you always wanted to do that or was it sort of like a you I, notice opportunity? I grew up doing that. So my father was in construction. My grandfather uh, helped my father with construction. They built homes. They remodeled places. My parents built homes, custom homes when I was, I don't know, 13, 14 years old. Then we moved down to Florida. Uh, we started, my dad got into some insurance stuff, some car dealership stuff, and then got back into developing again and was working on resorts and uh, spec houses and things of that nature. So mm. I grew up around this. And so, so what made you go, I'm guessing initially to home maintenance instead of GC first? Uh, because of the licensing, you know, here in Collier County, Lee County, you have to have certain licenses to do work in people's homes. So I could only get the handyman license at first. So I started out like a lot of guys do and do the bare minimum stuff that the handyman license allows you to do. And then as I learned more about trades and learned more about uh, what it took to be in business, I was able to uh, incorporate a few licenses at a time to build up the uh, capability of what we could offer at Becker Romanus. Mm, okay. Okay. How long have you been doing it for? Uh, seven years, April, no, it'll be eight years in April of 23. Really? Yeah. It's funny, it's funny how I've known you for so long. I've never asked you that. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> Been in business for a little bit. No, that's, that's good though, because I mean, seeing what you have done so far, to, I'm, I'm surprised it's only, like only been eight years because yeah. it seems like it's quite a, a large, broad company, at least from what I've seen. It, you're always busy. Yeah, we definitely are definitely busy. Uh, we've been blessed with 
COVID and the craziness that came with all the people moving to Florida and, you know, the housing, you know, boom that that came with that and the uh, inventory crisis. Uh, So we got a lot of uh, of work through that. And then right here recently with the hurricane, we've been blessed with another boom of, Mm. you know, of work that's come in and uh, job request. So, but it took a long time to get from there to here, you know, and, you know, from where I started doing the work myself, I was the first two years, I was just a guy on, you know, going house to house and Mm. hanging pictures and putting together, you know, people's furniture or Ikea sets or whatever it was. So what what did you do to get from that? Obviously the first two years is painful grind. A lot of people don't get past that point. The first five years was painful grind. (laughs) (laughs) And and then also last month. But most people have... Most people have the problem where they can't get past that initial jump of going from I do all the work because I make all the money right. to hiring that second person, hiring that third person. For you, what was what allowed you to do that next step? Mentally, financially, what was it? Well, I always have a yearning to do more, and I, I, I see things in the future. I have My mind was when I started background maintenance was not to just – you know, initially it was to leave the job, the nine to five job that I was working. The nine to five was more like a eight to midnight, but um, mm. I was trying to get out of that industry, which was wearing me out and do something for myself. So from that, I started the handyman company. I quickly saw that by bringing my style of hospitality and I'll go to any length to make the client happy or go to any length to make sure the job gets done correctly was a very, was, was a hit, was a success right off the bat. Um, so it was very quick to see that if I just apply this to all my customers and start adding employees, I could probably make this thing take off. Mm. The problem was the idea and the process don't always, you know, line up. So, yeah. you know, we did, we did well and, and we've been blessed, you know, we, the first couple of years we started, I did everything myself and I had a helper. And then I learned that I'd be more beneficial if I was out selling jobs. And so I started hiring more people. Then we had Hurricane Irma come through, and we were doing screen repair at the time. We did like 600 screen repairs in a year and a half after Irma. A couple property managers that I worked for, I hired like six screen installers, you know, and so things kind of blew up. And from that, our base grew. So mm-hmm. then there was like, oh, Beck Hermitus, what else do you do? You know, by that time I had had more license. We could do flooring. We could do painting, you know. So then the the base really took off from Irma, and then that rolled us into – covid and then that rolled us into you know where we are now so it's it's really it's really blown up and there's been a lot of struggles from being in the field by yourself to learning how to run a business mm. and one of our consulting team members that came in and kind of helped us over the last couple of years said you know the first three four years you were just self-employed you weren't really a business yeah you know it wasn't until i had you know uh, i had office staff i was doing sales myself i had an outside salesperson that i actually became a business so i learned um how to be self-employed then i learned how to run a business then i learned how to fail at business because we weren't making a lot of money <laughs> and then i learned how to make money you know yeah. by bringing in people who were smarter than me and and knew more about business and kind of structure our company in the right way figure out how to properly invoice and track profits and you know so now we're kind of gotten a nice groove going where we're consistent yeah that's that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand with business because, I mean, we're going through. Stace is finally experiencing. Obviously, this is a year in, and she's like, you know, I just don't understand how we can make six figures in a business in a year, and not have a house, not have these things. And I'm just like, that was the gross number, <laughs> you know? Like, what comes in versus what you keep mm. is a very different thing. Yeah, currency exchange. Yeah. Did you ever have those sort of? things with because i know that like i said with with our family that's the hardest thing is stacy is experiencing that alongside me and she's now finding out the problems or the the hurdles not the problems the hurdles Mm. and the reality of all right this is what it really means i'm not bringing home a hundred grand did you have any sort of things like that with the growing pains with obviously the marriage and the business happening as yeah, well? Yeah, things, things happen at a pretty steady rate. And we started, I think our first couple of years, we were, we were bringing in a couple hundred grand a year, you know, with like one or two helpers and myself, which was covering our bills and paying for materials and keeping the lights on, so to speak. And then we had a, we had a bump where we bumped up to like 700 uh, a year. And then from 700, we bumped up to like 1.5. 
Mm. And that's when I saw this like major like issue happening because in my mind, same thing as you guys, hey, we have a million dollars of revenue that's come <laughs> in in the first ni uh, nine months. Like where's the money? Because mm. I always had this mentality that, you know, when you hear millionaire or million that, that you've arrived. Yeah. Far from the case. I had, you know, $1.6 million worth of bills. That was the problem. Mm. You know, so that's when I came to, hey, I need to look at this. This is where I learned how to be a businessman or an entrepreneur. I had to bring in people who knew more than I did to help go through my process, my systems, and figure out how can we keep more of this money that we're bringing in. Mm. And, and then we learned, you know, through that through that company, that consulting team, that, you know, this is this is the way you need to do things if you're going to continually make money. And, yeah. and, and also do jobs the right way because it's not just about money. It's really about the reputation of our name and, you know, my family and our business being the best at what we can do. And when we're not the best that we can do, making things right. Yeah. So you guys really focused. Um, the big shift was changing, sorry, finding the numbers because I feel like that's what I hear a lot of entrepreneurs say is the ones that are super successful, the ones that know their numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's... um. I'm going to go through that right now where it's like, I know my numbers. I don't like my numbers though. <laughs> I know my numbers today. Yeah. I didn't for a long time. And I, that, that was a big shift of how to become to the next step for that's, you? That is business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the work that goes on is work that happens in the field, but the business is what I, I do with my accountant and my CP or my bookkeeper and my wife. And we go through everything and make sure that everything is on track. We plan for what's coming in the next two or three weeks. We see what we're paying out, see what's coming in and make sure that everything falls in line with our budget. Mm. You know, So I didn't have any of those things two years ago. Wow. As early as it was just close as two years ago. Bring huh? money in as fast as you can and pay everybody that you have to pay and yeah. see what's left at the end of the year. Mm. You know? Well, that is, a, is that also a, an important thing though, is you focused as well on executing the, the name broader and also making sure that the work speaks for itself, that m probably cutting the costs might have been a detriment to the long term in terms of like, you know, some people that worry so much about the margins so much at the start that they end up cutting costs, making it a little bit not as good when if they made it better, but it cost me a little bit more, they would have generated more leads. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you sort of learned when you were – uh, coming up that you're like, you know what? We did this, this, and this correct. Oh, I don't, I don't regret any, mis any, any move that we made. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because there's two schools of thought. Either know how to be in business when you start a business and you just take off from there and you know how to you know, produce profit margins. You know exactly mm -hmm. what your budget well, is supposed to be. I've never met someone like that. No. <laughs> right? So you, either, you already have the knowledge when you start a business to do that or you have to be someone like me who doesn't know, who was an employee of somebody for years and years and years, mm -hmm. who wanted to get away from that, who needed to go down this journey and path to learn what business really is. Yeah. And then I could respect it. And then I could find the right, you know, because through all that, I found great people. I found great accountants. I found great lawyers. I found beautiful people in the community that were other businessmen that have helped me grow my company, mm. you know, and grow my mindset so that I could be successful or that the company could thrive and not just fizzle out. Yeah. So I, I love that I went through that path. And I had the guy tell me, he's like, you kind of went the opposite way. You built this brand, which is everybody knows. You have the trucks, the signs, the advertisements. <laughs> everybody knows who you are, but you're not making any money, mm. you know, which was cool because everybody knows who we are. In a sense, that's kind of all I really needed at that time yeah. was, hey, I've, I'm successful. People know me. And then, you know, I started t talking to people who were more successful financially. They said, that's great. Now start putting some money in the bank. And now start, you know, start mm. thinking about the future. How are you going to provide for your family in the future? What are you going to leave for your, your daughter, your son, or, you know, as we grow? So. Yeah. But that, that takes years, though, to figure out, too. You know, like I, everyone I speak to that's, you know, we, I had a guy on a few weeks ago and I'm doing – the guy he worked for, his course, and, you know, he asked his friend, he goes, how long did it take you to make a million? He goes, first seven months. And the guy's like, fuck you. And he goes, yeah, but <laughs> here's the context. I failed at four businesses before that. Right. And most people don't see that. They say, oh, you started this business and made this money. That they don't realize how many mistakes have happened before. Oh, yeah. Um, so is Becca Home Maintenance your first business that you've gone solo with? Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, my, I have a couple of mentors, you know, and one of them said that, you know, I've, I've, I've made some huge mistakes that have mm -hmm. cost tons of money. And you know, my mentor said, 
Um, did you learn from that mistake? Then it's the best money you could ever spend. As long as you don't repeat that mistake, that $30,000 loss was worth every penny. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's that's kind of like the hardships I've had to go through to learn about success, uh, success or business or um, just just growing, you mm-hmm. know, as a person. Because I've had to learn how to deal with those losses as a person, not just as a businessman or an entrepreneur or the guy you see at the charity event or whatever it is. The guy who has to look himself in the mirror at home and say, what the F did you just do, bro? <laughs> like, <laughs> how am I going to face this client and let them know that we demoed the wrong bathroom? You know, uh, or how are we going to tell somebody that, you know, we ordered the wrong cabinets and we have to, you know, order them again, or whatever yeah. it is, you know, whatever <clears throat> it is. It's something that I've learned that as a person, you have to face those things. You have to take responsibility for those things. You own them and you fix them and you never make that mistake again. If it's yeah. Best as you can. <laughs> it doesn't always happen. Well, that's what I heard the other day. Someone speaking was, <clears throat> you know. The people that lose the most money are the, usually the richest people because they're the ones that take the most risks. Mm. Whereas ones that are terrified and they don't want to spend their money because they're going to get scammed, they never get scammed, but they never make money. Mm. And it's the same as even with business. It's, you know, screwing up the wrong bathroom by accident. Mm. It's like, fuck, you own it. It costs you money. But it's like, all right, what systems can we put in place now so that it doesn't happen again? Yeah. Um, what how much do you ever do like i mean yearly reviews and you break down what worked what didn't how to adjust for the next year is there any sort of strategy you guys have with that we actually have weekly meetings where we discuss everything that's going on in the company not with the employees not with the jobs themselves because that's considered you know what goes on in the field uh there's sections for that particular stuff but it's very brief it's really about how can we you know rate and and scale and and uh, track what we're doing as Becker Home Maintenance. Mm. And we can see the data as this is how many jobs we're selling, this is how many jobs we're finishing, this is how long it's taking us on average, and this is how quickly we're collecting. And if any of those numbers are off, there's a reason for it. Yeah. If our sales are really high, you know, compared to our collections and our finished work, you know, there, there's something wrong. So we need all three to kind of be going at the same time. Yeah. You know, and if our sales are down and our production and our and our collections are high, it's going to it's going to have an effect because then sales are going to be low the next month. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, it goes up and down. So if you can get all these things working at the same time, at the same at the same level, you have a lot more consistency. OK, that's cool. And so do you have cause you got weekly meetings? Do you have bigger Vision meetings where we it's do. quarterly. Yeah, we have quarterly meetings. Yeah, and then we have, uh, and then we have, you know, kind of like a, a end of the year. We write goals for the following year. We write what well, budgets for the following year. We really kind of try to scare ourselves with our goals. You know? Yeah, and the last two years where I've set goals, we've actually crushed those goals within like the six seven month mark. Really, which has been awesome. You That's know? cool. Yeah, goals are a big one. And how how often do you guys check back to those yearly goals? Oh, I live off of goals. Mm-hmm. Not only do I write goals, well, it's grown over the years because I've been writing goals since 2011. So 2011, I quit drinking, quit doing any uh, mind-altering uh, substances to, <laughs> you know, to uh, equalize my brain or whatever you want to call it. But uh, uh, since then, I had a mentor tell me, you know, you should write goals every year. Set yourself some goals, five five-year goal and one-year goal. And then yep. write down how you plan on achieving those goals because just writing the goal isn't enough. So over the past 11 years, I've done that every single year. So I have personal goals and goals, and now I have business goals. So I write both. And then I'm super descriptive. In the last two years, it's not just like, oh, I want to buy a new house. Mm. It's okay. How much does the house cost? What will that mortgage payment be? And how much do I need to increase my salary to pay that mortgage payment and keep all the other bills and investments and stuff that I do with my income mm. at the same rate? Because so I don't want to take away from what I'm doing. I want to add to. Yeah. So, you know, it's, every goal has to be like that. It has to be super descriptive. So I have, a, I have a, a means of achieving that goal. Yeah. Okay. I like that. And so is your wife on board with those ones as well? Like yep. she, you guys both yeah. sit down. That's the thing we're trying to figure out. Stace always goes like, we should do it. And I'm just like, yeah, but the 
I'm like, I'm running the business solo. So <clears> this, <throat> this So how month, would you do it? So this month we started, uh, I started a personal growth thing that I'm doing. Um, and then been watching some of this, this guy's videos. And, and, you know, there's all these things, of course, online. Um, and one of the things that it suggests is that you spend 90 minutes with your partner, mm -hmm. wife, uh, discussing things in your relationship that need to be worked on, addressed, like stuff around the house, cleaning, bills, uh, goals, you know, whatever it is that the two of you need to like handle business wise yeah. as a family unit, you know, it could be our daughter, <laughs> it could be a uh, school or it could be, you know, nanny, whatever, whatever that needs to be taken care of or addressed, cleaning girls, whatever's going to got an issue or, or going on. And then you should also take at least one day a week to go on a date, no phones, just the two mm. of you guys. So we haven't started that yet. But it is in the works, so I will be reporting yeah. back on how that goes. This guy suggested that we'll so make treat a, treat the relationship like a business in a way as well in terms well, of just, activities and just to handle the home front. Yeah, you know because you got stuff that has to be taken care of. Most relationships are broken up because of finances, confusion, lack of communication, those kind of things. So if you can sort through those ninety minutes a week, whether it's a three thirty minute sections or a sixty and a thirty, mm. go through those things, really discuss them. And then take two hours on a date to just spend time with your significant other, mm. okay, which I'll, I think I'll is a good that. idea. That's a good idea. I really do. Because if you can hash out those things that are going on, because what happens? You have a busy week. You don't talk about it. Yeah. A bill comes in. You don't want to talk about it. Or a credit card bill is higher than normal. Shit builds up. Yeah. And then it's like, yo, what the F, man? You got, we spending all this money for? Or, you know, why don't we have enough money? Or, you yeah. know. Why is the, the nanny not coming? Or why is the baby freaking out? What's the cost of living? Every time I check the credit card, because we got a joint one, straight away I'm like, what the f are you paying? <laughs> and then I, we, we go through it. And I'm like, I don't know how, but our expenses for, as a family, uh, grant, granted, we don't, have a, we don't have a mortgage yet. We don't have car payments. We don't have internet. It, like, There's a lot we don't pay for. And we still go like, how are we spending... Twenty five to thirty five hundred a month, mm. and most of it's food. Budget, bro. What well, was food, dude? That's yeah, the crazy. I created thing. a budget after I learned how to budget in my business. I created a budget for my home. Yeah, you know, and I can, well, I'm I'm anal like that. I can track everything. But cost of living, dude, is insane. Because yes. you know, same thing. I, I you say that number, and it's like, oh, three grand a month. How do you guys spend that? But then you break it down. And you're like, holy shit, this is actually the cost of living. Yeah. Because I, I go to states, I'm like, there's nothing on this list we can cut out, unless we start eating like two dollar mac and cheese, ramen noodles, bro. I can't noodles do that, noodles. dude. I can't do that. I don't want to be. <laughs> I, I love seeing entrepreneurs talk about that. It's like, yeah, you can live off ramen noodles when you're in your twenties, but my body can't just survive off shit food anymore. <laughs> like it needs to be high quality meat and stuff. Yeah. And your that's meat here is crazy. That's the drive, bro. Work harder, make more money, so you can eat whatever you want. Pretty much. Yeah. Angle that right at you. Boom. Yeah. See how it twists? These these things are really uh, temperamental. Everyone mm. has to put up with it. Hello. In this podcast. There. <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying it to Anna. I'm like, why am I so loud compared to everyone else? And I realize it's because I'm the one that only talks straight right into, into it. the microphone. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And so when we have to fix the audios later, it's like. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> um, but, you yeah, know, the cost of living is insane right now. And buy, that, buy a house, bro. Wow. That's why we're building a house. Build it's a house. cheaper to build a house, <laughs> which is insane. <laughs> I still don't understand that. But yeah. um, a guy broke it down. Kyle broke it down to me. He goes, people pay more for the convenience so they can buy it and move into it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I was like, ah, oh, good point. So anyway, that's a good idea. I'm going to have to try that out, schedule a time because that's uh, – they, they always say that the people – you can – Tell if someone's having a bad day 90% of the time based on how the relationship is at home. Mm. You know, you ask the husband, how's things going? And they're like, oh, it's shit. <laughs> and you're like, all right, how's the, how's the marriage going? Oh, I fucking can't stand her. Or like vice versa. And if it's great, they're like, it's fantastic. Really good in life. And yeah, it changes like the weather. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. But that's people. Mm. You know, I don't like half my employees most of the time, <laughs> depending on the day. Yeah. You know. And then there's times I love them. Wow, great job. Yeah. Yeah, it's no different at home, mm. you know. But that's the relationship you see the most. Well, I think, do you think that what the family life is more impacting in your day-to-day -day life than work or vice versa? Like the it's, 
it's crazy right now because we've been in such a growth the growth spurt for the last three three solid years. It's been really, really insane with the amount of work and the and the changes that have been going on and what we've been doing as a company. Um, but I'm I'm a family guy. Mm. I come home and I I drop everything and I try to spend time with my wife and daughter. We cook dinner five days a week. We try to have dinner at the dinner table. The three yeah. of us we talk about stuff. We joke. We laugh. I go back to work after my daughter goes to sleep if needed. Um, you know, just to catch up on emails or finances mm. or whatever's going on. And then we we do stuff. We, we're very family orientated, so we we do weekend trips. We do you know I try to not work over the weekends so that you know I can just spend time whether it's going swimming or going on the boat or whatever it is that we're doing to just spend time with each other. Yeah. So I would say right now it's probably 50-50 business and family um, because I make it because, you know, my, my daughter's three and a half. So mm. it's been really awesome three and a half years watching her yeah. grow up. And if I wouldn't have been there and I wouldn't have been able to experience the things that I got to, I know I, I would have regretted that. Mm. So I, I'm glad that I've, you know, kind of made time. And my wife pushes for that too. Like, hey, Olivia hasn't seen you, you know. Yeah. And I, oh, I, I, you know, so I got to turn mm. it on for a little bit. You've at least, you're at, you're at the point at least, I'm guessing the last three years, you're at a point where you had that leverage to open up some hours in the afternoon. Yeah, I mean, I make I make time and then that's a beautiful thing about working for yourself. I mean, like, I, mm. you know, if I have to, pull away from a job or pull away from the office and, and go do something that the family's doing or Olivia's doing or whatever it is, I can do that. So, yeah. And that is, that's awesome. Yeah. Cause that's the, the, the fun, the thing where I'm at right now is, you know, starting a business, finding those times. Cause I had this conversation with the father-in-law and he's just like, you should find like a business owner that has time for their family. And I was like, find one in their first two years steve that's that's what you need that's the actual caveat yeah because it's a hard thing it's like you know you speak to anyone where they go oh when you're starting business it's all in yeah um sacrifice today so that you can have real time later on yeah and so you know he sent me on this quest to find someone who is starting a business who is at home around 6 six thirty. i was like good luck <laughs> <laughs> um whereas everyone that i do know who has a family they you know, built the foundations before they had the family of yeah. the business. So there was at least that leverage point. Mine grew at the same time. Mm -hmm. So my business grew as my daughter grew. And I've been home and not present. And I've been home and present mm. because of what's going on in work or personal. You know what I mean? And it's um, it's at the point now where my daughter is old enough to see it. My wife can see it and whether she just decides to mention it or not. But yeah. um, my wife or my daughter will say, Daddy, Put the phone down. You know what I mean? So I, that's when I'm like, oh, crap. Like, I could be in her playroom and we could be doing princesses or whatever's going mm. on. And I got three clients texting me about stuff or subcontractors, whatever it is. And I'm responding. And I'm like, yeah. hold, on, hold on, hold on, sweetie. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And then I'm getting the, dad, put your phone down. You know, it's just he's old enough to tell me. Yeah. You know? And I have that little spot of awareness. Like, oh, crap. I should probably be present right here. Yeah. And As sometimes I'm like, nope, got to make this money. You know, yeah. so it just depends on the day. So many people, because it's another one of my friends back home said the same thing. It's like, it was, I think his son was about three or four at the time too, when he, him and his wife were called out by him. He was just like, you guys are always on your phone. And they're like, shit, you're right. A lot of theirs was mindless scrolling, but they, he's like, I don't notice it when I'm in it. You know, it's a powerful thing, this good old phone, yeah. you know? You, it's a gift and a curse, man. Mm. Definitely a gift and a curse. You've got a smartwatch, though. Have you noticed that takes off your... Is that an iPhone watch? This is yeah, the new Ultra. Ultra? Ultra. What's Ultra about it? It's bigger. Oh. I think it's more manly. Is I, it? I think, the, I think the Apple Watches... Until I saw this, I thought the Apple Watches were super gay. They are a little... So, yeah. I, I mean, I had one. Uh, did I say gay? Oh my gosh, that's better. Can't say that. I've anymore. said worse. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna shut my company down. <laughs> in my life. Um, but yeah, so I always thought that the Apple Watches were decent mm. until the Ultra came out. Soon as the Ultra came out, I thought, oh, my watch seems very feminine mm. compared. Wait, point that back at you. <laughs> compared to the. Ultra. So as soon as I saw the Ultra, I had to have it because I looked at my watch and I thought, man, this looks like a girl's watch. Yeah. And so I went out and got the Ultra so I look like I have a man's watch. Mm. I'm a man's man. 
You're Iron Man's man. Yeah. Rough around the edges. Yeah, I'm not soft or, you know, Put weak. Edge, man. Or anything. What's going see on how with this you, See how different you sound? Yeah, man, I sound great. How do you turn this thing, bro? I don't know. Hold on. Let's Hold try on. this shit. Pull that away. There we go. Boom. And now... Well, it's kind of angled down like an old man, you know what I mean? Oh. Oh. Yeah. There we, there we go. go. Hey. It's, it's all about how you how you handle it. <laughs> you got to manhandle it. That's true. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, no. I wouldn't worry about calling that watch gay. Well, the last watch. Well, did oh. you hear about, um, what was it? Uh, Apple Watch is gay. They are. <laughs> but um, no, did you hear about, ah, crap, there was this, uh, there was a. <laughs> Apple Watch Ultra is not. It's not. It's very manly. It is masculine. It's flatter. Yeah, but I, I just, uh. You know, it's got it's got a little bit more stuff to it. It's a little bit more. Yeah, we need the we need the knobby thing. Yeah, yeah. But no, that was. Did you hear about the thing about there was a mass shooting? What was and the was original? Gender... What was the original question about the watch? Uh, was... Take away something? No, no. So, because you triggered a thing that I saw on the in the news literally yesterday, it was um, it was there was a mass shooting by a gender neutral person, and oh. so CNN got a trans person on going, nah, it's a man. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> they literally were like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> He does. He we, he doesn't identify as that. He, we we choose. It was like, what happened? But uh, that's why I'm like, don't worry about calling that gay. I think we're coming back around, baby. Oh man, I just don't want anybody beating down my doors right now. I think you'd be fine. Yeah. I feel like everything's coming back around though. Like it doesn't. It feels like there's only a subsection of people that go crazy. Yeah. And then they're the ones that get the most highlight. But everyone else is just like, I don't give a crap. Yeah, I'm just so over the super sensitive bull crap that we're having to deal with these days. Mm. Which is funny, though, because when I grew up, I remember it was the other side of the political scape that was like that. Now, my dad used to say, we were the last generation of tough kids, tough guys. You know what I mean? Every and, generation says that. And now I'm saying that. Like, look <laughs> at these soft ass punks coming up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody's worried about their feelings and their sensitivity training and all this, you know. Mm. Bro, we would have boot stomped you in my day. You know what I mean? Like, if you talk like that. Like, yeah. Now those are like the terms that people use. Well, I, I honestly, I think it's just every single... Uh, Every single generation says the same thing about the following and the previous generation. Like, we don't realize how we're the same. Like, you know, the generation above us was really tough and mean. Right. And, you know, they didn't get it. And then they was, you know, then we say, oh, it's your next generation. They don't work hard. There's a saying that somewhere in Greece, there was a philosopher 2,000 years ago saying this next generation is doomed. Right. Because we're always we're saying always the doomed. same thing. I know. Even when the, the printing press first came out, they said that was the, going to be the demise of, of civilization because now information was too Just like the spread. iPhone. Just like the phone. The smartphone. Everything, everything yeah. is always going to be the, the demise of humans. Like we always think we're going to yeah. die. This is it. Yeah. End of the world. The internet will come though. 2023. What do you think is after the internet? After the internet? Yeah. Oh man, I, could, I couldn't even, I don't know. Huh? I just wonder. Telepathy or whatever the word is. Maybe it's that Elon Musk like brain thing, you know, like he's putting that Neuralink or whatever. Mm. Just because, like, you think about the printing press was a disruptor, the television was a disruptor, there, well, radio, then television, then it was the internet, and it's like, well, where did this come from? What's next? Yeah, you could know? be uh, virtual reality. Yeah, but then we were looking at like, the Matrix. I don't know if that's going to be that though. Mm. I think that's too far. Because you got to like you got to tell people to sit down and be still. Yeah, you're living in two different places. Mm. People will be lost in there, or some people will be stuck out here. Mm. What about augmented reality? Could be that. Is that a band? It sounds like a band. It does right? No, augmented reality is where you're half. It's like mixture of virtual and physical. So like you know when you see those Google glasses and stuff. Mm. <clears throat> Pokemon Go. Do you remember Pokemon Go? No. <laughs> <laughs> it only uh, makes like a billion disappoint some of your viewers 2016 <laughs> it literally shut down the world like almost as bad as covid yeah the so pokemon go was basically you've got this app and there's just it literally it was global so it was tied in oh i do remember maps. that yeah yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and you could see the little thing running around yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's augmented reality so you could be say walking down the street and then someone texts you and it pops up in your glasses yeah um which really makes me concerned about you know Realistically, and these days, other than talking to you, you know, and a few friends, mm. I don't even like my phone. Yeah. I'm over it. It's very stimulating now. Because I spend so much time on it, working, 
checking contracts, whatever it is, responding to clients, whatever, that by the time I get done, I'm like, I don't even want to look at this thing anymore. Yeah. I like to check I like to check my likes when when you know when <laughs> Sky House Media posts a new video of Becker on Maintenance. I do like to check in on that. Yes. A little bit of <laughs> Well, I've got like fact. six people's accounts on my phone. So I've had to turn notifications off all of them because it was just so much. Yeah, I was wondering how that goes when you get like one million likes. Like do you literally see one million people's thing on your So the Elon Musk one, what are we at now? I think we're at seven seven fifty K views or something so it's like i think it's at like thirty seven thousand likes but i've turned on my notifications off for likes i only get dms because i'll go back on and it will be like all right you got another 150 likes slide into cool. your dm is what you're saying basically that's all it yeah. is sliding in yeah i'm sliding into your dm mm -hmm. yeah i'm in a dm with you and a bunch of other guys working on fitness that's great yeah you know you don't write back to it though yeah but i don't respond to anything <laughs> <laughs> but so here's the thing i'm, I'm not gonna out people in the group, because a lot, a lot of being really consistent, but oh, some I'll of, out myself. I don't respond. No, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, more like keeping committed to what you say you're going to do. Yeah. Lay. Like, so, I'm not surprised, but I am. But you know, I my my schedule has been so whacked, especially like flying up and down West Virginia and here. It's like I've been going to the gym at nine thirty, and I hate it. But it's like I told this group, and I told myself. I'm training every single day for 30 days, no excuse. Even if it's 45 minutes of meh workout. It's better than nothing, consistency. Better than nothing. But, you know, some of, some of the excuses I've heard so far, I'm like, that's, that's a weird one. Like having a drink to celebrate something. Well, you know, you go to, I'm like, no, you don't. Tell mm. the person you're doing a challenge. Yeah, I remember Get that. Out. Yeah, <laughs> like, um, or, you know, even one of the other people who, really good friends, really motivated, but it was like, ah, I didn't plan my day. And like they messaged you this the other day, I think it was last night at 10 p.m. Like, ah, oh, I didn't plan my day well. I'm like, that's the point. It's 10 p.m. Go and train now. It sucks. You don't want to do it. I didn't want to do it after I got off a three-hour flight and three hours of driving a car. But at least for these 30 days, boom, I right. said I was going to do and it. And nobody wants to do those things. It's doing them that we gain the results, you know, yeah. it's by pushing ourselves and, you know, I'm doing the same thing. I have personal growth goals. I have fitness goals that I'm working on and I personally just don't feel I have time and that could just be my excuse mm. to share about them in a text group, but I'm still doing them and that's yeah. what's most important. My wife and I, I just started another one. We're both on a do the gym. We got two weddings to get ready for this, uh, this coming winter. So we're, uh, you know, trying to get in our best best shape, and it's just one of my goals for 23 is to be in my best physical shape. Um, you know, just crossed into the 40s, so I'm 41. So I want to stay physically fit. I want to get rid of this belly, mm -hmm. and just try to get fit and then stay fit, and and you know promote healthy um, lifestyle in our home as our daughter's starting to grow up, and you know possibly another kid coming soon, so that we can have a you know future of longevity in our family with with health and wealth yeah. prosperity spirituality mental health we want every everybody firing on all cylinders in a positive way mm. what uh because people don't realize as well i i think because i've been fit my whole life but it's been a priority yeah you're in pretty good shape yeah i appreciate that yeah but it's been it's been something that I, like it started off as vanity you know, like everyone has these like, oh, don't be vain. It's like, no, no, but the vanity was the, le like that was the That's gateway. That's what got you there. It was the yeah. gateway drug yeah. to getting me to be fit in my late teens, early 20s. But then when I tapped into, well, I want to look younger for longer without doing surgery and Botox. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to be that dude. It's a bit gay. But <laughs> 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 throw it back. Um, but I'm so obsessed with being younger for longer that it only led down to remove inflammation, mm. you know, boost your human growth, growth hormone by doing weights, exercise, but don't push yourself to stress levels where most people think they have to kill themselves in the gym. It's like, well, that's the opposite because if you kill yourself at the gym, you stress your body, which actually ages it. Mm. You want to be, you kill it now and then, mm -hmm. but by and large, it's just that consistent heavy lifting. But that obsession at, I think 22, 21 was where I, I dialed back how I was eating. Like I used to eat cheesecake for lunch, mm. love cheesecake. But 
now, sorry, but at 21, 22, I was like, I can't do this when I'm 30, 40, 50. So I dialed it back a bit. 24, dialed it back even further. 28, dialed it back. And now doing this challenge, it's like cut out all these things that I'm getting an influx of sugar and stuff. So no caffeine, no energy drinks. Sorry, no energy drinks, no chocolate. Mm. But it was what I've noticed then as well is I'm like, when I speak to some people and things that I perceive to be easy, they're like, oh, this is hard. And I'm just like, how do you live? Mm. You know? And I think that's when, when you start experiencing that stuff, you're going to be like, oh, shit, like, this is so much better. I can keep up with my kids. I can, yeah. you know, I'm happier. But I don't know. It, 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 I think unless people experience it, they don't really understand it. But it's, it's hard work. It is. You know? All things that are great come from hard work. Mm. Yeah. It's true. And consistency. Mm-hmm. These 30-day challenges may be happy because I'm just like, ah, oh, I've got that ticking it off when I'm at the gym. It's going, like going in that app. I've realized, well, made up app that I created. <laughs> There's something real rewarding with going click, 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 check. Right. And then the next day, click, 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 check. But those are important. You know, that's why they mm. try to set like measurable things that you can do on a daily basis that you can click off, right? So that you feel good about yourself. Because mm. you set this high expectation of this is my goal, let's say 30 pounds or, you know, 20 pounds of muscle. If you don't have any measurables in between that to motivate you to keep going, it makes it very discouraging unless you're just one of those people that's super you know, intense and motivated that you can just chase after goals. Yeah. I like setting these small little goals along the way to achieve and check off the box and then move forward and say, hey, you know, (laughs) my goal was 20 and I've already got to six. Yeah. You know, pat myself on the back, move on to the next one, try to hit 10. You know, so having those measurables in between is, uh, I think, is much easier. Yeah. I think as well, people set goals on the outcome rather than the, the requirements. So, you know, with losing weight or business, it's I want to make blank or I want to lose X pounds. The problem with that is sometimes it takes like it's like a bell curve. Mm -hmm. You know, there was um, Kerwin Ray, amazing business guy in Australia. He goes, set your 10 year goal to make $10 million. He goes, the thing is, you're probably going to make seven of that in in years nine and 10. Right. You know, you probably make a hundred grand of that in the first three years. <laughs> right. But when you set it long enough and you get a t- a addicted to the thing of the actions, the results end up just coming. And that's what I've noticed with this challenge with Duolingo learning um, Spanish. I'm addicted to the run of 30 days, 60 days, whatever, that the results of whatever it is, like just feeling good, I guess. I'm like, oh shit, that yeah. happened. But yeah. it's hard for people to do. I, I like mean. little things like that. I got a couple of people that I, I work with that we, we kind of help each other, you know, and spiritually and and, uh, and mentally. And we just set goals, whether it's read a book together, read something for 30 days or whatever it is, go through a challenge, you know, mm. and try to better just just for, you know, trying to better ourselves as, as we grow and grow. Um, and I, I really do. When I'm doing those things. It's like I have purpose. Mm. Even though I'm a father, even though I'm a business owner, even I got all these things going on, when I'm working with those few people and we're doing whatever it is that we're doing, it's like I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, I got to do my thing. Yeah. And I got to post, you know, in, in the group about it that done, you know, and I'm all excited. Um, you know, and, and for me, that's when I feel like I'm, I'm really doing something. You know, we talked about the other day that 1%, just trying yeah. to do 1% more. If I can just do 1% more than I did yesterday. I'm constantly moving forward, you know, mm. and it's compounding interest every day. Because that one percent yesterday is now another one percent today. You know, I'm constantly, constantly trying to motivate myself. Yeah. And I don't even have to tell myself to do that anymore. I just kind of do it. Mm. I just know, like, I did good yesterday, but I can do better today. Yeah, I'm gonna do something more today. I'm gonna hold a door for somebody. I'm gonna grab somebody's cart at the grocery store. Whatever it is, I'm just trying to do just a little bit more than I did yesterday. Mm. That's like that book, uh, The Power of One More. Yeah. Have you read that one? I've not, but I know that guy. Yeah. yeah. I'm audio booking it now. But it's <laughs> my audio booking experience is always like a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. Usually when I'm on planes because right. it's so easy. But that's what he says. He goes, just always think about what's one more thing. Yep. One more rep. Mm. One more thank you. One more email. One more phone call. Makes a big difference. Yeah. 
What's your one more with the business right now? Um, hmm. I suppose you're starting a new business. <laughs> That's like yeah. a hundred more. <laughs> right now, it's just one more day of studying. I just got this get past this last test. But um, no, I'm always, I'm always, always searching how to be better. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm looking and breaking down projects, figuring out what our profit was, figuring out where we made mistakes. I love sending out emails to people and say, hey, where did we make a mistake? Mm. Where could you see us do better? You know, a lot of times it's easy to get that five star review or something. Oh, they came in. They were great. Fantastic. Yeah. I like to then follow up with thank you for the review. Where could we have done better? Mm. You know what I mean? What did you see from an owner standpoint? What did you see that we could have done better? Oh, I left you five star review, but you know <laughs> the guy did leave you know some sawdust over here in the corner of the garage that you know could have swept out, but you know no big deal. We swept it out. Yeah. So that's something I I take note of. Make sure that we leave these job sites spotless. Yeah. Um. You know, or, or somebody says everything was great, but the communication from you know salesman or the project manager was less than par. You know, so take note of that. So we need to communicate better. How can we implement systems that help us communicate better? Yeah. Um, you know, so I do take those things uh, to heart, you know, and I think that that falls in that same mentality. One more. I don't have to send these people emails and ask them how we could do better. Nobody likes to hear criticism. Mm. But when I face it and I'm responsible for it and I own up to it, I get good feedback. Yeah. And then I can help my team become better. And when they do good things, they do they hit their measurables. You know, you give them a bonus, or you buy them some tools, or whatever it is that that, that might make them feel better in that moment. Yeah. You know, the other day, one of our guys, uh, all this was like four or five subcontractors at one place in a high rise. We were just installing cabinets, and all the contractors left. My guy had a couple pieces to put in, and they left a mess everywhere. Mm. And he cleaned up the whole condo and the hallway going to the elevator because it was a disaster. He even swept out there. And so this was uh, – I can't remember the, what, uh, what the day was. Anyways, we came back Monday to install cabinet pulls, mm -hmm. and so did three other contractors that were there on that Friday. Oh. And they told them, none of you can come into this condo today <laughs> because of the disaster that you left on Friday. But Becker can come on up because that employee stayed, swept everything up, cleaned everything up. We saw him on camera. And you can go in and work today. <laughs> so that right there was like huge. And, you know, we had our uh, Monday meeting, or, you know, the following following week. And my project manager brought it to attention that, hey, David did a great job. And, man, he got a bonus that week. Yeah. You know what I mean? I had to reward, to, uh, reward him because that's exactly what I want everyone to do. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's important. How do you manage as well, though? So one thing that's it's a tricky thing with reward um, is keeping it sporadic because if it becomes this assumed, then that can also be detrimental too. Um, do you have like an idea to keep it sporadic or anything, or is it just like I live? I live most most of my life organically like that. <clears throat> yeah, it's just when it's spur of the moment. Plus, mm -hmm. you know, I have a lot of people that you know um, kind of look up to me, so they they you know they're always asking questions. So when there's those personal one on one times. I, I just kind of feel it out. If I feel someone is in, in, in deserving, then, you know, you just take care of them. Yeah. But it's never like – I mean, we do have an end-of-the-year bonus, you know. I always give an end-of-the-year bonus around Christmas, uh, and that's that's pretty standard for all our guys. But then there's things that happen throughout the year, you know. Sometimes yeah. it's something like my guy's truck broke down. <clears throat> take it and use the company car to get a fix. And no one knows about that other than him and I. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Or somebody says, hey, bro, I'm you know, my sister-in-law is dying. I'm going to go – fly up to New York. All right, cool, I got you. Put the ticket on my cart. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that that no one else will know about. Yeah. That is important to them in that moment, you know. And sometimes they're not even doing a great job at work. It's just something that Yeah, pay you it kinda, forward. Kind of do just to keep your keep your guys happy, you know. Yeah, that's good. Cuz we we experience one thing cuz when it becomes ex expected, it's no longer you're giving, you're taking it away. Yeah. We had that with um with a, a business I knew where they gave him a bonus for doing certain things. And it was the same. It was every week, you know, it was like a 50 buck bonus or something like that. <clears throat> Only small, but it was like, you know, turn up a, to work on time, yada, yada, right. yada. But the problem was it was so consistent that whenever it wasn't there, it was taken away. It, it wasn't in, it mm. didn't take long for that to be perceived as, this is what I get paid, but they take away 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. Not this is what I get paid. And if I do these things, I get 50 bucks. Right. Um, 
so yeah, sporadicness that we learned was real important mm-hmm. because as soon as people expect the bonus, like again, I don't even know, like they've heard people talk about you know, quarterly bonuses or something. They work, but you have to have a real regimented, I guess, scale. Because mm-hmm. if it's like, all right, you if you do this, you get this at a quarter, someone can be consistent each quarter. And then the next quarter, they get it taken away. Yeah. We do reviews with our employees as well, you know. So we do have things that we measure them on and their performance and their attitude. And, um, you know, and also it's not always, you know, money that makes people the happiest. True. It's just giving them an opportunity to have an opinion or giving them an opportunity to um, throw their own ideas out there, yeah. you know, is, is important. Uh, people like to feel that their 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 opinion or their input is is important to those that yeah. are around them um and then of course you know respect you know people want to be respected uh and you know dealing with people you got different personalities we have 11 employees so we got 11 different personalities mm-hmm. and the way that you want to be talked to is not the same way that john wants to be talked to or tim wants to be, you know so yeah it's, it's, you have to be you know as a owner or a manager or the people i put in management you have to learn how to uh, you know kind of a- attack people or approach people in a different manner mm. Yeah. How do you like being spoken to? Uh, it depends on the setting. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. Yeah. Cause I'm, it's, but uh, respect. Yeah. So I, I worked in the kitchen, right? Uh, from the time I was uh, let's see, 30 to the time I was 34, 35. So those were the shit hour 34. days? 34, yeah. That, that makes sense. Crazy. Kitchens are I got blessed because I had never worked in a kitchen before. About that time that I talked about getting sober and, and changing my life around, um, I started working in a uh, catering kitchen for the St. Matthew's House, which is a homeless shelter that actually had a catering company within that homeless shelter. Um, and the chef that I worked for was a very... Um, just easy going. He, if you if you made a mistake, he'd come over and show you how to fix what you're doing. Nope, don't do it this way. Try doing it this way. Mm. He didn't come over and scream at you and tell you what the f and get the hell out of here and throw your stuff in the trash like I've heard other chefs are known for doing in that industry. <laughs> Ramsey, you know Ramsey. <laughs> we know you're out there, um, but yeah. So that mentality. And then I went to another company, uh, Crave Culinary by Chef Brian Rowland, and he was the same way. He led with a gentle hand. He wanted things to get done. He expected things to be done at a certain rate. But if you were struggling, you take the time to come over and show you, teach you, have you taste this? Why does it do this? Put more of this, try this, see what I'm talking about? Mm. Made you feel like you were a part of something that was important, even if it was just one little particular, you know, raspberry, you know, Kool-Aid that you were making, whatever it mm. was, that was the most important thing at that particular moment in that dish. And it just made you feel like, you know, your input or your learning or your your part of that dish was important. And so it wasn't people screaming at me. So I've, I like that. And my past, you know, uh, years, I didn't do well when people of authority told me how to do things or mm. yelled at me. Um, I would either say F it and walk away or I would react in a much more aggressive manner yeah so i'm trying not to live that way anymore and 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 do those kind of things so i i i I appreciate that softer approach but also with meaning you know and and you know there is there is an urgency to get things done and i like them to be done this way but if you have a way that gets it done in the same amount of time (laughs) and it works run with it yeah i'm not going to tell you how to do your job i'm going to tell you this is the job and this is the time frame yeah. And then if it doesn't work out, I'm super easy going. I'm like probably one of the easiest bosses to work for because <laughs> I am so laid back. But I do have those, you know, those time constraints and we do have clients who can be frustrating or difficult, you know, so you have to push your team members when you can, but it's just how, how you push them. And I yeah. think people do like working for Becker because of that uh, more softer approach. Yeah. 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 You, you, you coach, you don't dictate. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing that people get wrong. People yep. that hit power that probably shouldn't. And I always jump in the field. Like I, I'm never, you know, you, you've been on my job mm-hmm. before. I will jump on a machine and write it and show you how I want things done. I will tear something out and show you exactly how I like it to be so that the person that's coming in after has a better uh, uh, chance of installing, you know, more efficiently or, or clean, yeah. cleaner or whatever it is. You know, so my guys know that I worked in the field. You know, it's not like I don't know what I'm doing because I've literally done every job that we're doing, you know, as a, as a helper or a tradesperson. So, mm. you know, I'm able to to jump in at a, you know, ground level and say, hey, this is why I like it this way. Yeah. If you have a different way of getting to that point, cool. 
but this is the way I, I need it. The final product needs to be this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how you get there, whatever. Gotcha. So you're even very passionate about making sure that it's easy for the next contractor after that. 100%. And that's because it improves not only the experience, but I guess the relationship with those following contractors that they want to use you or they would recommend you more after yeah. that. I mean, I've learned from different people. Like I said, those things I learned in the kitchen on how to manage people and how to even mm -hmm. speak to an employee. Cause I remember being the employee and yeah. how I like to be spoken to, uh, compared to how I'm going to speak to people now. And then I've also learned from different businessmen, different contractors that, you know, I got a couple contractors that I work for that are just phenomenal and they, they continue to give us lots of work. And, and a couple of them have showed me one in particular. It's just been overwhelmingly, um, helpful mm. and sharing what he does in his company. And he came from a big company. So, you know, we, we kind of just work together on, he's like, what do you need for this particular project? Mm. Like, how much do you need? Like, no one's ever asked me, how much do I need? <laughs> it's always like, yo, what's your number? Yeah. And then they beat you up on it. Uh, less, less, less. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. Yeah. This one's like, how much do you need to make your full profit? Mm. And I say, that number. Yeah. He's like, cool. Now, what do you need to be successful? How many days do you need? What do you need me to have there for you? You know what I mean? He yeah. basically put things on a silver platter for me as a subcontractor, and I've seen him do it for others. And guess what? Those projects turn out phenomenal. Yeah. He's going over the top to make sure all of his people are taken care of in the manner that they're looking for so that their production is at a high level. Mm. And they're they're pumping out, you know, eight, ten million dollar houses, you know. Yeah. Killing it. That's a good point. Cause I it's definitely when I think about when I was helping with staff, it was the same thing. It's like, what do you guys like you said, what do you not like? What would you improve if you were the boss? Mm -hmm. And then how can we help? And even on a, a B2B basis, that's a big a big factor too. And I'm, I'm guessing then as a result, it's like you can't wait to work for that guy again or work with him again. Oh, yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about that. I mean, that guy and I have formed a great friendship now. I mean, mm. We literally hang out and I know his kids and he knows mine and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, mm. we, you know, but that's relationships. Yeah. Everything starts. How in, can in, I help? In, yeah. And that mentality of how can I be helpful? Yeah. What can I do for you? Because if I do that for you and you're successful, then I'm successful. Yeah. And that's really the key. It's not how can I beat this one up so bad that he barely makes it to the next job. Yeah. You know. But that's that short so that's that short term mentality. I've spoken to plenty of people, I won't say on here, but you know, same thing. It's uh I just don't think it's gonna cost that much. It's like, okay. Yeah. But then shop around. Right. Or, you know, I, I just don't see how, it, how I don't see how it costs that much. And you can tell it's trying to push it down, but it's like, all right, but the problem with that is now you're sacrificing quality because if it's going to cost less, then, you know, I'm going to cut some corners and you're going to get shit as a result that, you know, you, you see those people that do act like that and they're constantly chasing the next sale versus, oh, that was easy. I executed really well for this business or this customer and I don't have to look for more business because it comes to me. And I think, but that, obviously that takes a little bit of time. It does hurt your initial margins. But again, it's that thing of, would you rather be paying to find more people or making a little bit less to do nothing? Right. You know, that, that brand understanding. Again. Yeah, there's that, uh, there's like a TikTok video or something where the guy says, you can have things three ways. You can have things fast, you can have things good, or you can have things cheap. So you get to pick two of those. Yeah. <laughs> right? So you can have you can have cheap and fast. You can have or that might not be the right. It might I might be missing the three, but basically none of them work out. You yeah. know, when you take those two, you have things good and you have things, you know, I guess it's, I wouldn't be cheap, but there is one of those. It, it's basically, I know the one you're talking about. I can't it's it's the way he phrases it, it, it. Search it, for it, Anna. Search yeah, for it. <laughs> I want to hear it. <laughs> but yeah, so that's uh, – but that mentality, I like that mentality. So you can have things that are um, – they're good, they're they're fast, or they're – I think it's like – maybe it's even expensive. Or quality. Mm. Yeah, it's quality. So you can have – This is killing me now. I want to find I this know, out. I know. I want to hear it. That's right. We've got our own little Jamie that's in the right. making. Come on, find <laughs> it. But, I, but that's, that is so true. You get – you can have fast, you know, and Man. you can have – 
But um, people like you can you can mix mix the two somehow because <clears throat> that's what we're working on is like, oh wait no they don't have cheap. Like you can have cheap, but I know that everyone who is cheap, it's like you're gonna get your stuff back in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. I think it must be cheap, Did fast, you find it? good. Fast, yeah, cheap, or good. Mm. All right, cool. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Fast, cheap, or good. Fast, cheap, or good. So Those you, are the three, but you can't have all three. Well, that makes sense because you can have it cheap and good, but it's going to take a lot longer because it's not high on my production. It's not going to be time. Yeah, time. That's where it is. So Timely, yeah, so you're, yeah. So it's going to take a long time. You can have it. You can have it good and cheap, but it's going to take forever mm. because when I have time, I'm going to send people over there. Yeah. It's not high on my priority because yeah. I'm not going to make much money. So you can have good and fast, but it's not going to be cheap. Mm. Because I'm going to dedicate so many people over there. Yeah, that's true. That's what it is. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Because <laughs> um, that's what we noticed <clears throat> with our stuff. Like, once I got editing team, I mean, obviously that costs money, but, you know, people get their content back in a couple of days versus, you know. Yeah, speaking of that, when is my content? No. We just filmed yesterday. <laughs> uh, we have to reshoot a, a few things, though. Um, cause I want to get more content for that big house Yeah. cause the talking head one we did, uh, microphone problems, microphone was fine. The, the talking part's fine. I just didn't get any B roll cause we forgot to come back and shoot. Mm. So, cause we went and shot the grenade videos and then I didn't get the rust examples or anything like that. Oh yeah. Right. So we got that. And I might as well take the drone. So I'm thinking like droney, droney. Yeah. Something like Friday morning, you know? This you Friday, guys. you can be there. I'm not going to be. I'm, That's cool. I'm going out of town tomorrow. All right. I just enter the house. Just open the door. Yeah, the guys will be there working. <laughs> oh yeah, they will too. <laughs> they better. Um, be. But yeah, so because that is it, true, you can't have those three things. Fast, good, and cheap. Unless you're Amazon. I don't even know if that's true. No. I don't know. Oh wait, no. I don't want fast, to... cheap, and good. You get ah. Uh, I don't you, know. You get things fast. You get it cheap. Oh, no, their, their prices seem to be on point with everything else. I guess so. But so Maybe that's mm, the one company that can be fast, good, and cheap. Maybe. Ah, because then you're buying from China. Not even going there, bro. That's what I'm saying, though. If you're buying it cheap, you're buying from China. <laughs> right. But That's not necessarily the case either. That is true. Ameri- it, I, I, feel like, I feel like COVID really like shone a light on how fucked we are. <laughs> <laughs> how much that we rely on China. Yeah, well, they're, they're all saying, like, you know, every company now is like, yeah, we need to bring it back to American soil. I I love that idea. I just don't think it's going to happen because two years will go by and people will just forget. Yeah. You know, like, look how quickly a bunch of people are already forgetting, like, how they treated the people during COVID. You know, oh, yeah. all, all the people that were like, you're killing people. Softening you're the a blows. murderer. Yeah. And now we're like, and like, you know, you're a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> You queuing on? It's like <laughs> I just don't want to wear a mask. But yeah, now right. that all these things are coming out, that it's like, well, actually, these guys will write in a lot of these stuff. People are just like, oh, why do you have to bring it up? Right. Let's sweep that under the rug. Yeah. I don't want to talk about that. Did you hear Australia actually? As a, I posted on my story yesterday, Australia admitted that all the fines they gave out to people during COVID had no warranted. Uh, legal things so they're either refunding them or giving them that's back that's awesome at least they're refunding them yeah now if they just admitted and said sorry about your luck I feel like the American be more like, government would be do more that. like the American <laughs> government wouldn't they we apologize but we're not sending out any refund See, checks well that was what I did on my post it's like yeah uh, mainly because a guy was talking to me he's like everyone I speak to is like I heard Australia's really commie and like fascist and I'm just like look they handled COVID real poorly in the second half of it. First half, we did what we thought was best. Second half, terrible. Got crazy. But then my mate sent me that video literally like 10 minutes after we had that conversation. Because I'm so tired of hearing like, oh, I heard they're like, you know, Australia is crazy. Yes, they were. But but so was here. Again, Depending yeah, on where you were, so was here. Were. So was here. But the, um, I, I, when my friend sent me that, I go, I would, I would challenge the American government to admit they did wrong. Yeah. Even just one aspect, like, yes. Don't hold your breath. No. But I think as well, part of the, 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 
the benefit of being a small population, which is it's double-edged, which is they could control us because it's a smaller population, but because we're a smaller population, the reason that this whole thing's come up is because it was a small community thing. I think I'm, I'm maybe botching a little bit, but it, like a, it was a community file, uh, lawsuit that because the state is only like 8 million people, it was big enough to get some traction that they were like, ah, look, yeah, look, we're going to have to refund everything. Yeah. Our so, bad. Yeah. Which is crazy. Like, cause it, imagine, imagine if people knew that at the time, I wonder how different we'd act. I still thought the fines were ridiculous too. Like I heard about a couple that when you weren't allowed, you had to be, it was household related and you couldn't go anywhere in a car. Like if you had a person in your car at the start of COVID in Australia, they would pull you over and be like, show us your identification that you live together. Oh, wow. Because obviously you're going to a grocery shop or something. There was a couple who like, you know, little lovers in their early 20s, they drove, they're in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. Some winery um, up north from Sydney, they got a $2,000 fine because they were sitting in the car together. Mm. Like just shit like that where you're like, yeah, Australia kind of went loopy. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. But but there's, like I said, plenty of ex- examples of that here as well. Mm. But depending on how you look at things. And where you what are. What your viewpoint is on it. Yeah. Some people think what they did was absolutely perfect. Mm. Yeah. Well, there's people that still say Florida did terribly, you know? Yeah, that's their opinion. That's one thing I found out interesting about America. I was like, America's not really, it's, it's like 50 countries that just is under an umbrella mm-hmm. of one country. Because... Which was a benefit during COVID because if you didn't like how this state was you operating, went to a different one. you go to a different one. Yeah. Europe, you can't do that. You can't just be like, ah, I don't like how England's handling it. I'm going to go to Sweden. No. You know? Uh, same as Australia. It's like we our states were still, they were unified in a way, but then there was places like West Western Australia where they were insane. Like they'd lock down a whole city when one case got came up. Yeah. So... And then they, they wouldn't let people travel into the state. You know, you couldn't travel. Yeah. You couldn't cross borders. There was like s- strict lines down down the borders in Australia, which was, was kind of wild. definitely a wild experiment for a couple of years. That's what Yeah. I feel like, I don't know if people are going to go back to trust in the, well, some I think, think we passed or failed as a human race. Uh, I think it just highlighted. So my theory behind this is it's the first pandemic where the internet has been involved. True. So the internet is a thing where all it is is just a magnifying glass on everything we do. So we're right. like, oh, people are narcissistic. We've always been. Right. No, you people know. haven't changed. No. You're just able to see it more. On a, on a scale that's mm. like never been seen before right. because everyone's thoughts is getting put into this mm. system. you like, you know, when people go, oh, they only show their best face on social media. When before the internet did you go out to an event. And show your bad face. And just be like, how's everything going? My husband beats me. He's like, you know, I, I just don't know what I'm... Like, no, and people just go, everything's fine. Right. I love it. Yeah, it's called a facade. Yeah. yeah. We always wore those masks. Doing great. Yeah. Yeah, my life is fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. the issue with the last pandemic was... Like, the one before that was like 2008 or something. And it was... What was it? Swine flu or something? No, I don't even remember, bro. Yeah, before internet. Nothing. So we heard a bit about it, but it wasn't crazy enough and it wasn't as viral as um covid obviously but the thing about this one was one the news was so ingrained politically now mm-hmm. on a visible level because of trump then on top of that you've got everyone every mom son and a dog had an account tweeting correct things wrong things uh, opinions and just exponentially happening yeah that it was like this loop where You've got government and television taking data from social media. The loudest people on there are the ones that are bored, unfortunately. Like, you know, I was bored, so I was like loud <laughs> at the time. <laughs> but they're taking their data from this going, all right, if we we have to act this way to calm these people. When everyone else is like, can we just fucking move on? Right. But they don't have a voice because they're not bored. That I think it was just this cycle that was a problem. It was more about optics and then people getting then you'd lock people up at home. Now we're all bored. Now they're all bored. Now we're all bored. Except for us in Florida that we're working. Yeah. Yeah. Or everywhere else that was open and working. Yeah. So I don't know what the solution is, but I think it was more just that it was a, 
it was showing that it everything is not really about the thing it's about, like health. Right. It was more about politics yeah. than it was about health. And so did we fail as a race? No. I mean, shit. How many massacres have been in our history? True. I think we I think I prefer that over, yeah. <laughs> over you know, some crazy king. But I think we just have to learn from it, hopefully. Yeah. But, you know, I, I had huge risks with family over it because I was like... Oh, for sure. It tore up families. Mm. Couldn't even have that conversation at the Thanksgiving table. Yeah. Well, just things that were things that were common sense a year and a half before, all of a sudden, were conspiracy theories. Right. You know? Like, the you go like, hey, you know, maybe we should just focus on people getting in the gym more, eating healthier. You're like, oh, you're one of those conspiracy theorists. <laughs> When was that a conspiracy of eating healthy <laughs> yeah. like, or getting vitamin D? And right. It was just, it was a weird thing. But then coming here was like super weird for me because, I mean, Australia was like the typical rich person thing. You know, when like rich people look in poor areas and be like, why don't they just work harder? It's like, mate, you got an inheritance, you know? Right. Um, it was kind of like that with Australia. We were unfair advantage of an island where we could just shut off borders easy. Yeah. We also don't have as many people travel there as America. I think America has literally 15 times the amount of travelers per day versus us. So we could just shut it off. Boom, you're sweet. And the problem was all of a sudden you're looking over the fence at America, Europe, these huge numbers. It's terrifying that, when I flew over here, there was the thing where it was the first time I wore a mask and then I, I got off the plane. I was like, why the fuck am I wearing this? <laughs> but there was still that little bit in the back of my head going. Right. Ugh. And then all of a sudden when I get here, I was like, what the fuck are we worried about? <laughs> you know? And then three weeks later, Australia goes into a crazy lockdown. Yeah. So it was a very interesting observation on people. Yeah, it was. I felt like if you were busy working... In the public, because that you know, and if you were or you were locked down, if you were locked down, you were scared, mm -hmm. and you were watching the same thing over and over and over, and being told the same thing over and over. Of course, you were frightened. Yeah, you know, but those of us who were out living and working didn't have time. Yeah, didn't have time. I had so much work coming on. I had so many things. There were so many people. You know what I mean? And I was doing the same thing I always did. I was shaking hands and hugging people and going to lunches and going to job sites and you know making sure things got done. And when I got home. That was it. I mean, that, I didn't have yeah. time to worry about if I if I walked past someone who coughed or sneezed. I yeah, give two shits. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? <laughs> I don't <Yeah>. really care. <laughs> yeah, I got other stuff I'm trying to focus on, and because of that, you know, it didn't bother me. Yeah, you know, and and like I said, I did I did eventually catch it, but you know, it was like two and a half years after. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it before you. I got it like I got December. It. I got six months into being here. I got it in August. Ah. Yeah, first time. It wasn't that bad, was it? No. Nah. No. Did you get monoclonal antibodies, though? No. Oh, dude, I got them. Kicked dude, that shit I literally like four was hours. in the gym for five days before I realized I had it. Oh, really? Every single day, didn't feel sick. M my mother-in-law said, you know, your eyes look a little glassy. And I was like, oh, really? That's weird. My throat was a little, like, a little sore, you mm. know? But I literally was working out, and I was like, no, I don't have it. I don't have it. I don't have it. <laughs> and then four days later, my daughter was sick. And they were like, oh, we should probably test for it. And yeah. the two of us had it. Because I only tested for it when I flew back from West Virginia. I had like a a fever in the night. And I was like, huh, okay. Slept out on the couch, got the test the next morning. I was like, oh, I got COVID. Monoclonals an hour, two hours later. Then f nothing for the rest of the day. Like no, no fever, nothing. F three hour crazy fever at night and then gone. Yeah. I couldn't, because I was still positive, I was like, Probably yeah. shouldn't go to the gym and stuff, but dude, honestly, I I would. I've been way sicker with yeah. with other whatever you want to call it, colds or coughs or you know mm. bugs or whatever. So I, I would have never ever thought that that was COVID. Yeah. No. Well, after getting COVID, I was like, I'd take that over the flu, personally, because yeah. I was like, it was twenty four hours, basically two nights of intense fever for a couple of hours, but then nothing. I had none of that. And then you have like a cold and or a flu and it like lasts you a week. Oh, yeah. I've literally been like in bed shaking violently, <laughs> frozen, like, a, you know, need to go to the bathroom, but I'm too cold to get out from underneath the blanket, mm. you know. 
And, you know, that was way worse than my experience with COVID. Yeah. Now, monoclonals. Mm. Get them. That was so good. <laughs> um, I've got one question. So, I don't know. You don't have to go into this if you don't want to. But I'm intrigued about the journey through um, AA. Mm. Because that was a big life changer for you. Um, you have mentioned a couple of times on here. Um, what was that process and uh, what got you to that point of saying, you know what, I want to change? Well, we don't talk about the 12-step recovery programs because we have a clause of anonymity. Uh -huh. But I will say that I am a member of a 12-step recovery program. Maybe it's the one that you mentioned. Maybe it's not. I cannot. Oh, okay. uh, I cannot uh, claim that uh, in any radio, film, or press. It's part of our tradition. Really? I'm sorry yeah, about that. No worries. <laughs> uh, but the process from um, finally deciding that I need help until today is, is the the best thing I've ever done in my life. Mm. It's the thing I love to talk about the most. I. I I'm blessed to be able to um, work with a lot of other people who are in 12-step programs. And it, it's literally, other than my, my wife and daughter, it's the highlight of my life. Because really? my life exponentially got greater the day after I quit drinking and drugging. Really? Plain and simple. That makes and sense. from that point till today, it's literally gotten better every single day. Yeah. And then the amount <clears> of people <throat> that I've got to help through that process and along that journey has been, um, you know, I mean, it's literally the best show on earth. Yeah. Watching people <clears throat> come in broken like myself who have no hope or no aspiration or no even uh, ability to think they can capably do anything because they've been such a failure or such a, a derelict or whatever you want to call it, um, get their lives back, get jobs, mm -hmm. buy houses, get engaged, get married, get their children back, get their wives back, build successful businesses or go to work. You know, I have people that... Uh, that I've worked with that have never even been able to like have a job and now are, you know, managers of, you know, corporate restaurants or whatever it is. You yeah, know, there's wow. so many, so many people's lives have been in, you know, positively changed and 12 step programs get a bad rap because a lot of people don't make it. You yeah. hear so many, this is <clears throat> why the press, radio, and film is so important because so many people say, oh, hey, I'm in this program and look at me, I'm doing great. And then 20 mm. days later, you see him getting arrested for drinking and drugging. And he's like, yo, yeah. that obviously doesn't work, which is far from the truth. Ah, okay. And that's why we have that clause <clears throat> in there is to, to prevent the negative um, spread of, of that doesn't work when it absolutely works for the people yeah. that actually do the work and stay in the program and, and, and continue to work on themselves, it does work. Yeah. It's the people who choose to not do that and go back out to uh, to that old solution, mm. you know? So, but yeah, but it's been a highlight, man. I, I've, I've got to go uh, all over the country. I've even, I've even got to speak uh, about that particular program outside of the country at a couple different things and um, help so many people. Uh, and, and it really is, uh, it's, it's, I I don't I couldn't have anything that I have today if it wasn't for that twelve step recovery program. Yeah, that has made me the person that I am today. That and a lot of hard work, and that's what a lot of people don't understand. It's like anything; it's a lot of hard work. Yeah, that has to come first every morning. You know, when I wake up, there's a pro, there's like a routine that I follow. Wake up, I read some stuff. I I uh, I talk to God. I ask for help. You know what I mean? To keep myself sober, keep myself on the right track, and to constantly be willing to be of service to somebody else that might be in need of the same kind of help that I was in need of because the whole deal is giving back what was given to me. When mm -hmm. I was in need, someone was there to help me. And now that I'm in a better place, I want to be willing to help somebody that's in need. And if I do those things and uh, participate in that in that 12-step program, you know, I have a fighting chance to stay sober today, and then that makes everything possible. If I'm drinking and drugging, all bets are off. You know, yeah. and there's no, there's no saying if I could keep my company or keep my family or keep my daughter or whatever it is if I'm going down that path. Mm. So I got to do whatever it takes to make sure I don't go down that path again, and then everything I can do, you know, then every other option is, is yeah. at, at my fingertips. So do you find having routine in that commitment on a daily basis is what keeps you strong no oh, the routine is is uh is a big thing it's really an interaction with other people that are like yourself mm -hmm. i mean that's what i found in these 12 step programs what no matter which one you're in or which one you're a part of um is this finding people who understand and identify with what you're going through 
Yeah. Because if I have found a way out and um, you come to me and you're struggling with the same thing that I struggle with and I say, hey, well, look, this is what worked for me. You have validation from someone who's gone through it. It's an experience, right? Yeah. This is, I was the same way. I came in, I was 30, and this was how my life was. All right, cool. And I came in, I was 35, and that's, my life was the same way. What did you do? This is what I did. This is how it worked. When you start doing it and you start experiencing maybe the same thing, it becomes tangible, it becomes real. It validates the whole deal. You know, mm. so there's identification. Now, if you come in and you've never experienced anything like that and I'm trying to get help and I'm like, yo, do you know what it's like to be living yeah. this way? And you're like, no, you should probably find someone it's that can relatable. help you. Right. Yeah. So that, that's where it's all about. It's really about like-minded people helping each other. Uh, we call them sober references. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? How do I <laughs> live my life, you know, from the first day I get sober till now? Is but I have to build a bunch of sober references. Yeah, you know, I had never gone on a date sober. I had never been um, to a party or a dance sober. You know, I've never been, you know, at work sober. Whatever, whatever it was, <clears throat> I always had some kind of, you know, smoke or booze or something in my system to make me feel comfortable. So when I get sober, I have to learn how to live this way without yeah. the vehicle that made me comfortable. Got you. So. So for you, it was like a coping mechanism in a way for social interactivity, et cetera, activities? I think it was a coping mechanism for a lot of things. I yeah. think, you know, the, the realm of uh, mental health issues and depression and uh, feeling less than all stem from being empty on the inside. Mm. And once I found something that was better than those outside vehicles to make me feel full on the inside, and in, in my experience, it's been God, mm -hmm. you know, and helping others. You know, I needed this. I needed this relationship with my creator, and then I needed to be able to help other people do the same thing. And from doing that, I feel better than any other thing I've put in my system. And I put a lot of stuff in my system. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. So okay, so the, so it's the act of giving as well. Is that fulfillment that you were one hundred percent missing That's before that fulfillment? I am fulfilled by helping others. Yeah, more so than anything that I do. More so than making money. More so than my business. I mean, it's absolutely the best thing in the world to watch the lights come on in someone else's life mm. and um do you find that it's it's a very a common thing of that it's a bit of an escapism because i i'm speaking from i've never had that you know at issue issue thank you um i've never had it personally i mean i've had addictions to other things usually addictions to having problems if that makes sense mm. like oh no my life sucks like that was a mental addiction for me. It was, you know, putting people down. Mm. So um, that's taken me years and like, you know, sometimes there's re relapses, so to speak, when yeah. shit's not going well and it becomes woe is me. Um, is, do you find that there's usually an emotional connection as well with a lot of people? And um, I'm not saying this is everyone, but is there like sort of a common thing that is like that, that lacking of something, like lacking of purpose, lacking of... Um, I have found in the years that I've been around that it is usually something in someone's childhood before age 10 mm. that happens that's traumatic of some sort, whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's uh, an authority figure like a father or a uncle or something, even, you know, physical abuse, um, Basically, as a child, I think it wounds, and this is my opinion, I have no scientific fact behind this, I think it wounds us, and I can only speak from my own experience as well because I think that's what happened to me. Someone I look up to at age six, you know what I mean, that's older than me, who I like, um, completely destroys, you know, my, my, um, my outlook on authority or someone I looked up to or whatever it was causes this like traumatic break in my in my little brain mm. and from that point on like I never could deal with authority so you know me and my father had issues when I was younger um, I had a um, I had a thing where I was sexually abused by a boy in my neighborhood you know what I oh, mean shit. so and it wasn't anything crazy I wasn't raped or anything like that it was just him being weird he did something weird to me you know it was like just made you really uncomfortable. Made me uncomfortable. Like, dude, why did you do that? We're playing Nintendo. Like, yeah. Why? Why would you even do that? Like, put your freaking clothes on. This is weird. And I yeah. left, and I never went back. You know what I mean? But why would that kid do that? But 
mm-hmm. I can look back and say, is at that point where I started saying, man, like, you know, when you tell me what to do, I was saying F you because I'm not, I looked up to this person for so long and he did this weird stuff to me. And then in my, in my own father, you know, was, you know, very hard on me, you know, you know cause I was kind of like a bad kid, you know, but that was after I had, you know, I just had, you know, I don't know. So I, my own father was like being mean to me or whatever. And so then I never liked teachers. I never liked cops. I never liked people telling me what to do. And so I've done some research since getting sober that basically it kind of goes in that steam is something happens to us when we're young that breaks our trust mm. and we no longer trust the people who are telling us how to live our life, you know? And the thing with my father was he was a heavy drinker. Tell me not to drink and do drugs. And then when I get older, I find out you've been drinking and drugging. Yeah. Like, who the F are you, bro? Like, this is why I did what I wanted to do. Yeah. Because you're telling me not to do stuff, but you're doing it. Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, it breaks your it breaks your trust of the people that you look up to the most. And you think, if these are the people who are raising me, if these are the people that are teaching me, if this is my, you know, quote, unquote, buddy in the neighborhood and they're treating me this way, then the whole rest of the world is probably going to treat me that way. So I have mm. to build these defense mechanisms up where I'm not listening to you. Yeah. I, 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 at six years old, now I, I know better than everybody mm. because you hurt me. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's so true. Like the... The one with about your father, like, you know, actions speak louder than words, like telling you not to do something that they're doing. They very much guilty of themselves doing. That's what, because that's what I experienced a lot, which was, you know, growing up. You can't it, ground me and take my weed and then smoke my weed, bro. Yeah. Like, come yeah. on. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't have that person, but it was more just like these <laughs> constant things of telling I mean, me not to. that's all legal now, but it's, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> yeah. wasn't back then. But it, it's even that, like, I mean, because I was never in like a, a legal sort of things like whatever like that but it was it was constantly seeing hypocrisy is what made me not trust a lot of people right you know i didn't go down uh that the route you did but i went down definitely an emotional toxic route and it was all stemmed with self-worth yeah being told what you can and can't do but it's like but you're doing the same shit right i was young uh I got so many memories where I would be like picking it apart and rather than the, the whole family's going like, just shut up and say what he's doing. I'm like, man, fuck that, man. That guy's <laughs> doing this. Why can't I do it? Or, right. you know, I was like, you know, my favorite one was my, my grandfather and he loved me to death, but it was, you know, some of the things I just like, I don't get it. And it was, if I ask why, mm. and you tell me why I never ask you again. Like that is my thing. You explain it. I go, Oh, a lot of people can't handle that. Yeah. Um, they take it as being confrontational. It's like, no, it's called, it's called I don't fucking understand. <laughs> mm-hmm. But like one was as, as silly as it, as it was, which was like, don't wear a singlet, uh, wife beat a singlet on the leather couch at the beach house. Don't know why there's a leather couch at a beach house because you'll get oil from your skin on the, the couch. Makes sense. Why is it okay for women to do it though? <laughs> You know, <laughs> why, why, why do I have to wear a sleeve shirt? But right. they like stuff, shit like that, where yeah. it's, again, it's not crazy. It's not overly traumatic if you look at it as a micro thing. Yeah. But when you're that person going, hey, that doesn't make sense. And it's years and years well, and years. I look back and figure that those are the fundamental stages of your brain really growing between mm. one and 12. You know what I mean? And I don't, I don't think we realize how smart we are at those ages in yeah. the sense of what we see. I see something. And I understand it, but my parents are telling me I don't understand it. Yeah. Like, no, 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 I understand it. Yeah. Don't tell me I, I don't understand it. And it's hard to think back to when I was that age, but I do kind of remember, like, I'm not stupid. You know, mm. you told me, like, it's, you know, it's, you know, there, there's no cereal left. No, no, there's cereal left. I just found a cereal. Yeah. Don't tell me there's no cereal. You just don't, get, just don't want me to eat cereal past eight o'clock. Yeah, just say Don't that. lie to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I think it's those little discretions that happen throughout our our childhood when we're like, don't treat me stupid. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and then, so then I start to rebel against. So then if you're telling me not to eat cereal past eight o'clock, so when you're also telling me not to jump on my bed, I'm going to question that authority as well. Yeah. Well, you it lied to me about out. cereal. So obviously I probably can't break my neck jumping on bed, which I probably could, but, <laughs> you know, but my mind already tells me I can't trust these people. Yeah. You lied to me a couple of times. I've yeah. caught you in lies. And then you look back. See, the, the beautiful thing about the, the process that we go through in the 12-step program is I can look back and say, given the opportunity or given the uh, 
putting myself in my parents' shoes, they did the best that they could, right? Mm. With what they had. I was probably a crazy little kid and, you know, a maniac running around the house, you know, jumping off couches and beating up my sister or whatever it was at that particular time, you know. Um, they did what they thought was best in that moment. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I'm not mad at them. I'm not resentful at them. There's nothing that, that, that I can look at that from an adult standpoint now and go, golly, you know, mm. I was an MFer, you know? So <laughs> no wonder they beat me with a belt yeah. or whatever it was with a shoe or whatever, you know, because I was a maniac, mm. you know? So I have to, I have to own what, what my responsibility is in that as well. And yeah. then also look at it as, you know, they're just two people trying to figure this thing out too. They didn't know any better than I know sitting in this chair right now. Yeah. I'm trying to raise my daughter the best as I can, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Only time we'll will fuck tell. up and we'll make it like. <laughs> only time you know? will tell. But I find though that the, the, the heating, I had a conversation with someone recently about this. I find that the, the physical punishment of kids, it's more for you than it is for them. Like in terms of if you're the hitter. I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't do it. I have a little girl. So maybe when I have a little boy, I might whoop his ass, but right now I, I can't touch my See, I, I don't, I wouldn't even do that. <laughs> I'd do it in like a friendly, like teach the kid how to fight sort of situation right. like the boy. But I find if I'm sort of reverse engineering it to the best of my ability, hitting a kid, and this is not an anti-discipline, I'm pro-discipline. Right. But hitting, hitting a kid if you're gonna, hit, if you think that's a good discipline thing, why don't we hit adults? Right, because be they can hit back. Right, that's why we don't do it. So don't tell me it's an effective form of punishment, because you're only hitting someone who's smaller than you who can hit you back, who can't who hit, you can back. hit you back. And so the hitting of them is about me, the hitter, feeling good about it, going "fuck you, you yeah. deserve this," versus having that patience long term to be like. Shit, how can I like navigate, like treat it like how the government did it with COVID. You can have a choice about being vaccinated. Yeah. You just can't do this, 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 and this, but it's a choice. Right. You do that with kids. And that's what I'm, I'm have you read the book Raising Lions? No. That's how he does it. And it's, I'm, I'm start, like, Sienna's now getting to the age where she's starting to like 14 months, he says, where they start perceiving their str like their place in society. Mm-hmm. And he does the same thing. It's like you you don't overpower them. You don't let them overpower you. It's this it's this thing of if you want to scream, it's fine. I'm just gonna you know when you scream, you scream in your room, and then you you know you, you can physically pull them gently because you're way stronger than them. But you just say calmly, like you know you can have a tantrum. Just have it in the in the room. Yeah. If they don't want to go in the room, now they got a choice. Like sometimes I'll go in the room and they'll fucking lose their shit. Great. It's out yeah. of my, I don't have to hear it. But if they. How old's your daughter? She's 14 months now. Okay. Give it some more months when she throws complete tinsel temperament in the middle of a store. Well, that's what I would just end up saying. <laughs> and you try to calmly talk to them when they're screaming Ooh. at the top of their lungs so, from the know, back of the store all the way to the car. Do you know the funny thing though is? I don't care what other people think. No, I don't either. But my wife, my wife and I have had this experience. Like my daughter mm. has had those moments where she literally, oh, yeah. you're trying to grab her and she's smart enough now. She slips her arms oh, like this. She already does that. Hold her. She's holding. She's like, <laughs> and she's screaming and kicking and she doesn't care. And, and she does not care. Trust me when I Bad. tell you, it's great. You go from the back of Best Buy all the way to the car out <laughs> way in the parking lot with a three-year-old losing their mind. Yeah. And you put them I'll in the car seat. have to think about a grocery shop version. And they're not letting you put the <laughs> seat belt on, you know. Uh, oh, it's oh, fantastic. Sienna's already doing that. She doesn't do it at the moment. She was doing it a bit younger. But again, it's like you're stronger. It definitely so test your patience. It oh, definitely yeah. test your patience. It definitely does. Like I said, and we don't hit. But That's why I meditate. But I practice that. <laughs> I do a lot of meditation as well. <laughs> it's the only thing that keeps my head on straight. Yeah. Honestly, meditation is phenomenal. Because that's what when, when Sienna would do that, she she does the scorpion mm -hmm. on the, the car seat. Oh, yeah. But it's the same thing. It's like, all right, so Stace would just hold her feet. I'll hurt her head. She can't twist. And I just go, eh, at the yeah. hips. It's like sometimes you just have to be not physical, it's but it's like right. using a physical yeah. advantage. You just have to use your brain. Yeah. Yeah. They're just monkeys. Some, yeah. Just says something about them. It's crazy. They are fun. They are very uh, interesting to watch develop. Yeah. Super interesting. It is. It's one of the most, it's definitely the most rewarding thing I've done. You know, it, it's watching my daughter grow up and, and become in, inquisitive and to ask questions and mm. and to uh, find her own identity. I can do that. I'm a big girl now. 
<laughs> cool. Go do it. Yeah. And then you hear whining and crying. I can't get my pull up on by myself. Do you want my help? You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, let's, you know, but, it, but, you know, they have to go through that same way I had yeah. to go through it. I had to learn, you know, she's got to learn. So, and it is, it's so, so much fun to watch and then the talking and, you know. Yeah. You'll get there. Well, already it's like, I mean, cause I only see her one week a month at the moment cause of freaking bastard Ian. And, yeah. um, it's wild. Even like every, I don't see her for three weeks, two or three weeks. And then I'm like, you're a different person again. It's like, you know, I'm missing out on all these things, but it's like, I mean, what can I do? I can't stay up there. No. Because then it's like, all right, we're broke now. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's, it, I'm going to have to think about versions for the, the grocery shop now. I'm not saying it's 100% foolproof, but it's like... Yeah. No, I love all those books and, and everybody suggests things. And I really do think it just comes to you and your and your wife mm. and uh, figuring out a way to to discipline and love in the best way you can. You yeah, know, because everyone has their own opinion on stuff, and you know, I'm sure there's things that are good, and I'm sure there's things that are bad. But like, I'm not gonna say who am I to freaking say mm. which is right. We do what works at our house. Yeah, yeah. Because I've lo- I've noticed that that sort of technique of choices works with business too. Yeah, in a way, because it's like it's the same thing as like, we'll do a good job or you lose your job. Right. You know, you got a choice. Yeah. You know, show up or not. Mm. You no, know, doesn't Either matter. You have a job or not. Right. And same like mer- like incentives, you know, like rather than saying like you need to hit these numbers, you get a bonus based on these criteria. Yeah. Or you don't. Right. Yeah, those measurables. Yeah. So it's like you have a choice. Yeah. Do you get paid this month or you don't? <laughs> and we all have choices. <laughs> yeah. There's also consequences. Yeah. 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 I would always like, I don't know, I won't ask out on this because it's not really relevant, but I'm always wondering, I'm interested to see how people really keep keep it as a, at a tight sort of a consequences in a way for the employees without it being like a dictatorship. Right. Yeah. I'll ask you that later because I don't know how to form that question, but <laughs> we'll wrap this up. We've had a good one. Yeah, it's been great, man. I'm enjoying, enjoying our, everything we're doing. Our friendship, our business relationship. Yeah. It's all been good, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so for people trying to find Becca Home Maintenance, where do they go? www.beckerhomemaintenance.com info at beckerhomemaintenance.com 239-351-6820 and if you guys are looking for the best social media content guy <laughs> in the world Sky House Media over here Sky killing. Media House everyone, Sky everyone Media says House. Sky House Media Sky Media House I'm going to change the name I've just decided I'm changing the I see name. the bills I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really remember <laughs> the name of it no but it's weird even it's Jenny number our two. editor kept, all I keeps calling know. it Sky House Media I'm like Jenny that's not what our business name is. <laughs> Sky Media House? Yeah. Sky Media House for name. your content is phenomenal. Yeah. Anyways. I, I love it. We've seen massive, massive growth on our People are social media them. sites and our fan base. Everyone keeps calling me and telling me how funny our videos are. Good. Ooh, love it, dude. Was that actually, that was one thing I forgot to touch on. It sounds like you're at the next point, which is like you were. Is this going to cost me more money? No. <laughs> you're grinding, you're grinding, you were grinding the first few years yeah. and then you started putting people in and you focus, you realize that you are the, you're the sales guy. And now the next job is what we're doing with your content, which is you're the sales guy, but you're now the face as well, which pulls the people in at least from leads, the videos and everything else. So that's the next the brand. Step. Yeah. Yeah. So it's fun. We're doing the right steps. Yeah, man. It's great. Yeah. I appreciate it. All right, cool. Make sure to subscribe guys. Bye.